High above St. Pauli Landungsbrücken, the landing stages, the mighty Bismarck monument stands in solitary splendor. At the edge of the Geist and just in front of it are the buildings of the Nautical College, the Naval Observatory, and the Institute for Tropical Diseases. In 1938, the port of Hamburg took first place in importance on the continents and third place in the world after New York and London. The port of Hamburg was situated in the heart of Central Europe and therefore in a unique position for transit traffic. St. Pauli Landungsbrücken, with the prominent clock tower, was of great importance for the heavy public traffic in the port and on the lower Elbe. Every year, hundreds of thousands of passengers embarked and disembarked, and the many visitors melted, melted into the fascinating atmosphere of the port with all its unusual sounds and smells. The Landungsbrücken were also the regular berthing area for the tugboats of the established Hamburg tugboat companies, which assisted the freight and passenger ships during arrival and departure in the often narrow harbour basins. The view from Steinwerder conveys an impressive picture of the old part of the city. One senses the beating of the pulse of the world port in the lively traffic on the Elbe. Steinwerder is the home of important shipyards and industrial companies. Many of the freight and passenger ships shown in this film were built there. At the overseas bridge, the Überseebrücke, we can see the Wilhelm Gustloff, a passenger vessel able to carry 1,500 passengers and just recently commissioned. The Gustloff was exclusively fitted out with outside cabins, a significant feature and novelty in shipbuilding in those years. Foreign shipping companies held a considerable 45% share in the import and export of goods in the port of Hamburg. Shipping is international. The film shows not only German, but also many vessels sailing under the Norwegian, Danish, French, British and American flags. Foreign passenger vessels such as the Colombie of the French state-owned shipping company CGT or CGT were also regular callers to the port. Whilst OPDR steamer Bilbao in charter to Lais and Hornlines Mimi Horn are departing, Norddeutsche Lloyd's large East Asian freighter Lahn arrives from overseas. In the light of the rising sun, the Königin Luisa finds her berth at St. Pauli Landungsbrücken. Hapag Sea Resort Service vessels were also dispatched here with departures taking place early in the morning at 7 a.m. The Königin Luisa was in service to Cuxhaven, Heligoland and Zult. During day trips, the motor ship, built in 1934, could carry up to 2,000 passengers. The motor vessel Jan Molsen of the port steamship company Haddock, which also sailed to Cuxhaven, enjoyed special popularity. In 
In 1888, Haddock, the Port Steamship Company, was founded so that a regular steamboat service could be established in the quickly growing port. Considerable results were achieved when thousands of shipyard and dock workers had to be transported daily at change of shift. The silver funnel of the ferry shipping company was decorated with a green ring. It became a very successful hallmark. Voyages to the lower Elbe were made by bigger vessels, such as the motor ship Burgemeister Distel, shown here, while the service to Harburg via the Kölbrand was still operated with historic paddle steamers. Over the centuries, Niederhafen at Johannes Bollwerk and Vorsetzen was the only dock in Hamburg for seagoing vessels. The sheds for services to Duisburg, Düsseldorf and Cologne on the Rhine as well as for the traffic to the North Sea and the Baltic, were located there. In the shadow of the large passenger liners moored at the Überseebrücke, many smaller steamboats of established shipping companies loaded and discharged here. The Niederhafen dock portrayed a lively picture of smaller traffic in those years. Handling of goods in a port is varied because the cargo composition on every vessel is different. In liner traffic, one has to pay attention to the careful treatment of the cargo. This work can only be managed by trained people. Trained workers were therefore mainly used in harbour work. In 1938, around 20,000 trained staff were employed as dock labourers, winchmen, key and warehouse workers, crane operators, and lightermen. The professional groups were united in a special harbour organisation which also covered shortages at different working places. When necessary, a call out was made by radio. Moving of cases, barrels, and bales was hard work and was mostly carried out by hand. Even though electric carts existed in the port, the barrow remained the predominant means of handling on shore. The port of Hamburg is a tidal harbour and therefore dependent on the tides. It consists of an older part on the right side of the Elbe and a modern, larger left part. The shipping traffic became a mirror image of the highly developed industrial Central European hinterland. Special significance was directed towards the waterways traffic. It made up 50% of the transshipment in the port. 1,350 river barges were registered on the Elbe. The Upper Elbe connected Hamburg to the Middle and Eastern German waterways network, as well as Poland and Czechoslovakia. The inland shipping basins surrounded the docks of the ocean-going vessels, so that the barges did not obstruct freighters entering and leaving the harbour.
In 1888, Hamburg joined the German Customs Union, leading to the birth of the Freeport. Since then, the Customs Channel has separated the Freeport from the city. The channel connected the port with the upper part of the harbour. We can see a few of the typical steam tugs, of which 450 were in use. They were owned by Leitermann companies, which operated the internal lighter, tug and launch traffic within the port. Characteristic for the steam tugs was the collapsible funnel, which made passing under many bridges possible. Even though 45,000 trucks had already been counted in 1938, arriving or leaving with cargo, there were still many horse carts around. The Freeport was a duty-free customs area where all goods were transshipped, transported, stored, and re-exported duty-free. When going through customs, people and vehicles were thoroughly checked. The quayside sheds in the docks for general cargo vessels served mostly for the quick transfer of goods. The storage of goods took place in special warehouses and storage facilities in the free port. The state-owned Hamburg Freeport Warehouse Company had more than 830,000 square meters of storage area. In comparison to the mostly ground-level key sheds, the warehouses were multi-storied and very solidly built. Different goods such as coffee, cocoa, tea and spices were stored here. Furthermore, samples were taken, goods repacked and prepared for export. In those days, Hamburg was the most important European transit trading place. The most famous landmark of the port of Hamburg was the Zeitbau Tower at the top of Keyshed A on the headland of Santor Dock, popularly called Kerwiederspitze. The large warehouse built in 1875 was the only one which lay near deep water and therefore accessible for deep draft vessels. At noon, Greenwich Mean Time, the black ball fell and showed the seamen the exact time. From above, one had a good view of Santor Dock already built in the 1860s, as well as onto Grassbrook Dock lying next to it. In both of these harbour basins, freighters for Holland, Belgium, Britain and Scandinavia were handled. Next to the big gasometer of the Grassbrook Gasworks, Strandhafen Dock was situated. The key facilities were used by foreign and German freighters in the Scandinavia trade. Shift change. A Hadag ferry has brought dock workers to the landing stage at Zantorhöft, from where they leave the port via Niederbaumbrücke to Baumwahl. Hadag offered grand harbour tours with their ferry boats of the Monkeberg class during off peak times, which enjoyed great popularity. Downstream on the Elbe, 
past the fish auction halls at the fish market and Elholzhöft, we continue on to Oderhafen Dock. Hamburg had over 30 kilometers of deep water berths at mooring piles. It was possible for freighters to transship their cargoes tied up within the port basins using lighters or river barges. We can see the Lauterfels of Hansa Steamship Company Bremen at the mooring piles in Oderhafen. We also meet Hamburg Zud's elegant motor vessel Belgrano, as well as United States Line's passenger liner Washington. In the partially covered, widespread storage area of Holzmüller Company at Hachmankai, which was situated in Rosshafendock, fine and hard woods were handled. The center of the European wood trade was located here. We approach Kaiser Wilhelm Höft, the landing stage of the Kaiser Wilhelm dock by a Haddag ferry. Before the First World War, the harbour basin with sheds 71 to 75 was purpose-built for Hapag's needs. Hapag, better known as Hamburg America Line, was the biggest German shipping company. The new freight and passenger ship Patria lies at the head of August Victoria Quay below the 75-ton crane. While the brand new diesel electric ship Patria sailed to the west coast of South America on regular service, the white-painted Milwaukee reveals that she was deployed as a cruise vessel. The sister ship too, the motor ship St. Louis, lies here at August Victoria Quay. Behind the vessels of Hamburg America Line, one can see the motor vessel Fulda of North German Lloyd Bremen. Opposite in the dock, NDL's fast East Asia steamer Gneisenau unloads. Looking back to the other side, one can see Hapag's New York. She was one of four popular big passenger vessels on weekly service to the east coast of the United States. As a special attraction, Hamburg America Line allowed the guests of the Grand Harbor Tour to board their passenger liners. The New York and her sister ships with a capacity of 8,500 tons were also equipped to load general cargo. As one can see, it was very busy at the berths of the Hamburg America line. A look into the shed at the August Victoria Quay reveals a variety of different kinds of cargo. To a large degree, the liner shipping consisted mainly of general cargo, which required rapid handling at the quayside, to and from the trains and protected temporary storage in modern sheds. The volume of general cargo assured Hamburg a leading position in Europe. The internal harbour had a very efficient railway system of 480 kilometres length. The Harbour Railway was built by the city 
but was operated by the Reichsbahn, the German state railway. A further eye-catcher in the port of Hamburg was the imposing cable crane facility over the slipways of Blumenfoss and Steinwerder, the biggest German shipyard, which achieved fame with its many new buildings, such as, for example, the fast passenger steamer Kapakona, shown later in the film. In the outer shipyard basin, German, Norwegian and Argentinian tankers undergo repair or completion. From the ferry of the Grand Harbour Tour, one can see the heavy cruiser Admiral Hipper, which lies under the 250-ton heavy hammer crane being equipped. In the many floating docks, we encounter familiar ships again and again, which are being repaired or overhauled. Hovartswerke shipyard at Rostock also has a big cable crane facility and a heavy crane with a lifting capacity of 200 tons. At Vulcan Key, behind a tanker, work on the passenger motor ship Robert Lai is being completed. In this shipyard too, all floating docks are fully occupied, among others by the freight and passenger ship Cap Norte of Hamburg South American Line. From Deutsche Werft, the film only shows the repair and new construction facility at Reierstieg, which came in the fore in the 1930s with a whole sequence of new buildings. Deutsche Werft's main business was located in Finkenwerder and was not included in the Harbour Round Tour. The ever busy Überseebrücke served the purpose of handling big passenger vessels. Behind it lies the floating youth hostel. Hein Gordewind, a former French bark, which was converted by Blum and Foss. The Überseebrücke lies in front of the Niederhafen Basin and was mainly used by Hamburg Zoot's passenger vessels with their attractive funnels. While Orient Steam Navigation's passenger liner Orcades was moored a beam of Key Warehouse A, different freighters maneuvered in the river among these two steamers from renowned Dutch shipping companies. Hamburg was also the most important port for transshipment of grain. The cargo was discharged over the side by means of floating grain elevators. The Grand Harbour Tour also visited the docks situated in the east of the port, such as Barkenhafen seen here, close to the city. German Africa Line's vessels were handled there. The shipping company was the result of a merger between German East Africa Line and Wurman Line. While the Usambara, tied up at the quay, carries the colours on the funnel of the German East Africa Line, the Tanganyika and Wadai, in service on the West Africa route, carry the colours of the Vermin line. Foreign vessels were also dispatched at Barkenhafen, like the two Dutch freight and passenger liners Colombia and Costa Rica, which served the West Indies. Like a landmark, a heavy crane marks the entrance at America Hurft to Hansehafen Dock. The regular berthing places of vessels of Hamburg Zood, a Hamburg South American Steamship Company, were located at sheds 45 to 47 of the Oswald Quay. In the harbour basin, a hustle and bustle dominates as the traffic to and from South America played an important role in Hamburg. 
The freight and passenger liner Monte Olivia is surrounded by many lighters. Lighters were the main vehicle for transport in the harbour. Especially interesting to see here is the versatile key configuration of the port of Hamburg, with several rail tracks on the water side, making direct transshipment between freighters and trains possible. In 1938, an entire range of German-made products, from the steam engine to the pin-making machines, electrical products, chemicals, cars, etc., were exported. Hamburg Zuts vessels, such as the steamer Santos, seen here, brought primarily huge amounts of coffee, skins, tobacco, cotton wool, and many exotic goods from the east coast of South America. On deck, slings are received and marked by the stevedores. They are responsible for the competent loading and discharging operations in the port. A difficult and responsible assignment. A foreman looks into the hatch and gives the winchman signals by hand. On the bags, one can clearly identify the country of origin, Brazil. The freight and passenger vessel Monte Samiento unloads coffee and bigger quantities of cotton wool, which are received by key workers at the shed. The cotton bales weighed 250 kilos and were still transported on the quay on barrows. Foreign vessels such as Eleman Line's City of Nagpur and the Swedish motor ship Baderland were also handled in Hansehafen. Even though five almost identically built passenger ships existed, the Monte Rosa was the most popular. She was the last in a series of motor vessels built for Hamburg Zud by Blom and Faust, and just like her sisters, she was a one-class passenger vessel. The universally deployable motor ships took 1,400 passengers and were able to accommodate another additional 1,000 passengers between decks. Even though they were destined for service to the east coast of South America, the ships were put into service for tourist cruises because of their special features. Trips to Madeira, the Mediterranean, and to the Norwegian fjords were offered. In the middle of the 1930s, whaling underwent a renaissance in Germany. In 1937, the German shipyards delivered the first newly constructed whaling mother vessel, the Walter Rau. While the mother ship handled the catch, the whales were chased by specially built hunting boats. The film shows the hunting boats of the whaler Jan Wellem. <laughs> In the loading and unloading of mineral oils, Hamburg took a leading position. In 1938, 3.6 million tons of domestic and industrial fuel were unloaded. That was equivalent to 70% of the entire German oil imports.
For storage, extensive tank farms were available in the petroleum harbour. The pilot station at Seemannshöft and the marina which lay adjacent were situated directly next to the petroleum harbour. Early in the morning, in the pale light of the rising sun, the snow-white German state yacht Grille enters the harbour. Following her is the torpedo boat Jaguar, which belongs to the Predator class. Hamburg was not a naval port. Visits by warships did not take place very often. Nevertheless, foreign warships did visit, like the two sail training ships Cristoforo Colombo and Amerigo Vespucci from the Italian Navy, which are shown here. It was a rather rare occasion when both ships were seen together in Hamburg. Here they lie together in Magdeburger Dock. Finally, the most interesting pictures are of Hamburg's flagship, the shapely Queen of the South Atlantic, the fast passenger steamer Cap Arcona of Hamburg Süd, which had operated in regular service to the east coast of South America since 1927. Despite economic problems during the 1930s, the South American route and intensive attempts by the competition to get the better of her, she remained the favorite of the Latin American public. Customs control in Germany was strict for departing passengers too. A final check of boarding passengers took place on the gangway bearing the broad inscription Hamburg Süd. By getting up steam, the loading of passenger cars was still taking place with special equipment. It looked dangerous because of the sloping position, but it was an approved method, which was necessary for small hatches. After the hatches were tightly closed and the derricks were set down, the voyage could begin. The Cap Arcona was an exceedingly elegant and comfortably furnished express liner, which enjoyed high local and foreign esteem and Hamburg was proud of her. <laughs>